This is the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition Dungeon Master's Guide. In this book, among the rules and advice for game masters, both helpful and questionable, are a variety of appendices. These have everything from random tables for creating your own dungeons and world maps to pages of critical reference tables. Among these is Appendix N, a list of recommended works of fiction that can spur your inspiration as a dungeon master and as a player. Included because heroic fantasy and swords and sorcery were not as well known then as it was today. Other RPG books since then, including other editions of D&D, have continued the tradition of providing recommended works of fiction to spur players and game masters, later going on to include television series, comics, and films as well. However, generally, these sections omit works of anime. It's time to rectify that. This is the Anime Appendix N. When we last left off on covering recommended viewing for anime, I had discussed the concept of the spectrum of seriousness and comedy. Discussing different series are within the spectrum of seriousness and comedy in fantasy anime, where different series land at points in the spectrum in, in terms of inspirational works, and how in particular the series of The Slayers did a solid job of landing right in that sweet spot right in the middle. This time we're getting into more specifics, discussing a few different anime series that can provide recommendations for specific things that you can take from uh, to show to your or take from their, that show to your gaming table. As before, some of these shows have been covered in my game recommendation series because I've got a bit more of a focus on fantasy. However, in those instances, I was approaching those shows from the view of finding a tabletop game system that emulated that particular show well. Here, my recommendations are system agnostic. There are things you can take from these shows that can be carried over to any system and any or almost any setting. As always, the utility of these recommendations will vary based on your campaign and on what your players are interested in in terms of in what ways they want to engage in. First off, watching Log Horizon can help with working within an established world. Now, I'm using Log Horizon in general here, but this could really work with any isekai anime or manga or light novel based on an MMO that the main character within the work has some familiarity with. Could be Final Fantasy Lost Stranger or even Overlord. One of the core wrinkles with these shows is that the worlds in question are ones where the players know them very well because they've spent extended periods of time within the their story with back in the their old life playing the game when it was just a game now now that they're inside the game they're finding that elements of the world don't quite work the same way that they remember now on its own we'd be just working with the territory of basic advice for working in a setting the players know however these particular varieties of isekai show take things one step further they change something significant about the setting Sometimes it's a setting element, sometimes it's a thing with a where it's a game mechanic from the source material which has significant setting implications. For example, it's a significant plot point in the early seasons of Log Horizon where the intercity transport gates that were a big part of the fast travel system when this was a game are shut down. And it's just as big a deal when two of the gates are reactivated in the show's third season. And the reason why the gates were offline in the first place is at the beginning, one of the things, mysteries of the setting that our characters are investigating. So how do you work this into a game? Well, if you are working with a setting that the players know well, normal GM advice is to change things about the setting to fit your game and to keep the players on their toes. Particularly if it's like one player in particular who is very knowledgeable about the setting. However, often the advice is to say, well, just in this campaign, that's how things are. There is another option, however. Call attention to the change. And or if not if not dramatically to call attention to it, but when the player or players who are familiar with the setting notice it, to highlight it and say, Yeah, yeah, that is different. Wonder why that is. 
Now, you to do this right requires a little more prep to come up with reasons why this change happened. However, your players, because they are clever, inventive, devious, and also looking for hooks in some manner or another, not always the ones which you put out for them, will come up with a few reasons on their own. So while you should absolutely do that prep, do not be afraid to let the players come up with an answer for you. Now, say for example, you are running a game in the Forgotten Realms and you don't like Elminster. You think he's a GMPC who is overpowered and represents a lot of what can be frustrating about the realms in general. Now, the easy thing to do would be that just in this campaign say, hey, Elminster never existed. And that is 100% a viable op option that you can take. However, what works just as well and can provide some real game opportunities is when Elminster goes up and go, yeah, Elminster's real. Um, he vanished 50, 100 years ago. No one's ever seen him since. Like, so many people talk about in Legends, but doesn't really seem to be a thing anymore. Now, your players, who have your own metagaming knowledge of who Elminster is and what he's capable of, now have their wheels turning. Um, dead? Is he in prison somewhere? And with what we know, what the what the players know about what Elminster can do, who could it, who or what could have killed or imprisoned Elminster? And also, what's left behind afterwards of both that which did harm to Elminster, which took El Elminster off the table, is did the thing, the being, or crap or what have you um did it leave anything behind um is it still around or is it dead if and with elminster out of the equation what's going on with this tower in shadowdale all that sort of thing and this can work especially well for any other setting there's any sort of cataclysmic overhaul to rework the setting between editions of the game for new mechanics or what have you like various D, &D settings like dragon lance or greyhawk Shadowrun, our Talzorian games is Cyberpunk, The World of Darkness, all just to name a few. Next, Delicious Dungeon can teach you the value of using every part of the monster, so to speak. I've mentioned this when discussing Delicious, Delicious in Dungeon in the past, maybe not in a video, more in a blog post, but nonetheless. There is a couple panels from a Knights of the Dinner Table strip where the knights are talking about a, a pending fight with a purple impaler. And Brian Van Hoos mentions how useful the monster parts can be for spell components and magic items, but they're real bleeders, ending with a sentence that stuck with me for years. Ah, well, slay and fillet. And now, decades later, decades later. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I found out about this manga, Delicious in Dungeon, a manga that's basically focused on the ecology of the Underdark. They don't call it that, probably because Underdark's probably trained. But not just in the sense of, oh, some monsters eat other monsters, but that some monsters develop biological strategies to avoid being eaten that can also in turn end up being helpful for humans. Um, or not even just monsters, um, other bits of dungeon ecology, plants, some of which may be ancient. Um, all that sort of stuff. But basically it looks like the idea that, you know, maybe, just maybe, your party could actually manage to live off the land inside the Underdark. The manga, from the jump, is based around coming up with ways to use monsters, parts of monsters, and elements of dungeon ecology to survive inside the dungeon without packing a bunch of stuff with you, to travel light so you can move quickly, and in turn, thinking about non-standard forms of treasure from monsters, going beyond harvesting monster fangs and venom. In game turns, how you'd handle this if there isn't existing information in your rule books or monster book question is to put a little more thought in terms of monster placement and monster environments. In this case, if, you're just, if you feel up to doing some research and say you're doing this in Dungeons and Dragons, I would recommend hunting down some old monster ecology articles from Dragon Magazine, along with some of this loosely comes up in Bolo's Guide to Monsters and Mordor Kynan's Tome 
um, guide to homophobes. But again, loosely, there's um, Mordenkainen's focused more, and Volos tend to focus more on monster societies. And a lot of that is stuff because, as has been recently been made, as Wizards has made very clear, Volos kind of monster racist or demi non human racist. Um, in more than a few respects. So keep that in mind as well if you're using those materials. But the old Monster Ecology articles are still good. Um, Hackmaster for their Hacklopedia of Beasts tends to include some information in terms of monster stuff. Um, less based on ecology and more just based on, oh, here's alternative treasure sources. But it's useful resources to get you thinking about certain things. And lastly, from fairy tale, we can learn something about how adventurers fit into society as a whole. So, good question to ask. In your campaign, how do adventurers fit into your society? And particularly your party of adventurers. Are they a group of friends thrown together in a quest to save the world? Are they a bunch of skilled fighters from disparate backgrounds initially brought together out of happenstance and then adventuring together afterwards out of friendship? Maybe they're part of some secret society that travels the land, righting wrongs wherever they find them. Or they're part of some formal governmental order tasked by authority figures to seek out threats. Or maybe they're part of some structured sort of organization that the public can turn to in order to find help, something recognized by the government and licensed to operate, but not themselves a governmental body, a sort of union for adventurers to help them find work and provide resources, a kind of adventurer's guild. This latter option is the structure used by Fairy Tale. Now, Fairy Tale, the guild within the anime, has, well, or the series of the same name, also manga, has a variety of adventurers equally as powerful on their own, if not more powerful than Lena Inverse. Only without Lena's insecurities. However, the organization in the show also serves as a really good example, no matter what the power level of your game, of an alternative way to handle the idiom of adventurers within the confines of a heroic fantasy setting. Rather than registering individual parties as an adventuring company, like with the Forgotten Realms and in Waterdeep, making them part of a larger organization. The guild provides access not only to various resources that adventurers need and a place for guild members to meet up, but also a job board for work. King needs giant slain? There's a posting on the job board. Someone has a mysterious treasure map that they want to investigate. Posting for an expedition. This applies to other aspects in the game as well. If a player's, a player's character bites it on the job and you need a way to introduce a new character to the party, there are this provides a way to do it where the new character is an established member of the guild. Also gives you the advantage when it comes to character knowledge as opposed to player knowledge, where that a new character, because he's a guild member, has a degree of familiarity with your player, with the previous character and other jobs that they've been on. Um, it's an, or you could even say, oh, this your char previous character talked about this in the guild hall and that sort of thing has had an opportunity to pick up some of this information. Uh, give a chance for the to avoid having to rehash information to this degree from a, a role playing standpoint. Um, and for that matter, um, if you're using an older edition of D and D or a retro clone that re requires or recommends that players go player characters go to a trainer to level up, have someone mentor them in uh, when it comes time to again to take on skills as well. Um, well, the guild has either, either someone you can train with or can refer you to someone who can if you have to travel to go find someone as you're a higher, it's a higher level character or because it's a very distinct skill or in circumstances where a particular, where it's like it required from a quest standpoint, um, in the sense of your character has leveled, your, your paladin has leveled up enough where it's time for them to go on their quest to attain their holy event, that sort of thing. And at higher levels of play, there's not just finding more challenging jobs that you can do. There's also the matter of guild politics. How does your guild get along with the kingdoms or other governmental bodies and the countries around them? 
How do they get along with other guilds? What happens in the world, as far as structures in place, if a guild turns bad, goes evil, starts getting up to nasty stuff? What happens if a ruler with evil intentions uses a guild as their proxy for their malign plans? That sort of thing. And even within the guild itself, what happens when the current guild master retires? Who takes over? If it's the PCs, how do they handle running the guild? If it's not the PCs, who takes over instead? Are there multiple candidates? And which one does the PCs side with? And what happens if the one the PCs back loses? And on top of all of this, there is the whole matter of once the PCs really get up there in levels in Dungeons and & Dragons and similar games, you have at higher levels getting to what's called domain level play, where the characters are getting much more involved in the politics of the area. So consequently, what if instead of taking ownership of the, um, or contending for ownership with the existing guild, what if they decide to go off and start their own with the, because of the reputation that they have accrued with, as part of their existing guild, does their current guild, they know we're not cool with that or do they offer their support or do they just say, okay, good luck with that, but we're not going to, we got our own concerns. We're not going to help you out. Same thing with other guild members, all that sort of stuff. Well, we covered a lot of ground here, only three series, but much deeper dives on each than we've done in the past. Next time we're going to get into a different tack and get into covering series that we haven't talked about as much. Um, there are other genre we haven't talked about as much. We're going to be getting into science fiction. And one of the subgenres of science fiction that anime has truly helped to shape the most. No matter how many other writers deny it. That genre is cyberpunk. And we'll be doing us again another sort of spectrum analysis. But this one less humorous to serious and more of the varieties of campaigns you can do cyberpunk genre that will be when we return to the anime appendix Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>